Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. If you'd like to turn in your Bible, everything will be up on the screen, but we're going to look at several. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 2, then uh, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 41, and then we're going to find our way to uh, Luke 11, Mark 16, and who knows how far we're going to get. We'll, we'll just kind of take it, take it as it comes. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, uh, l- listen to what Paul says here. He says, but we, brethren having been taken away from you for a short period in presence, but not in heart, endeavored more eagerly uh, eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, it was personal, time and again, but listen to this, but Satan hindered us. And I want to just kind of park you on that for a minute because as Christians, we, we don't think about that component often enough or soberly enough. There's lots of times where we're trying to get something going and man, it's just hard and we keep feeling like two steps forward, one step back and, and things are twisting and turning and that ah, didn't work out and we have to recalibrate and do it over and, and, and we're, we're looking at circumstances, we're trying to be responsible to deal with the things that are coming at us and, and, you know, and, and stewards and practic- practicums and all of those things, but we don't stop to think about that lots of times we, we're being intentionally hindered. And Paul said, this is the apostle Paul. Paul said, I want you to know that I got taken out of the loop. I wasn't planning on leaving, but I got taken out of the loop. I never did in my heart. I was always with you. And because of that, I tried more eagerly than ever with a great passion. No, we got to get back there. We got to get back there. We got to get back there. But I was never able to pull it off. Over and over, I kept trying and trying and trying. And he said, it's because Satan hindered us. And, and then you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul actually gives you a list about the number of hindrances that he's encountered. Now, I'm not going to read you the list because it's quite extensive, but I do want to read you in verse 23. It's just he gives the categories, and then he goes back and he starts unpacking those categories. And again, you, you can read it's quite a list, but here's the categories. He said, in labors more abundant. That means I worked harder than I've ever worked before. I work harder than I should have had to work. It's like, this shouldn't be this hard. And I'm working and working and working. He said, in stripes above measure. In other words, there were political situations and religious situations and, and, and uh, financial or economic impacts from preaching the gospel. And he was like penalized for that, like physically. Like he, he got stripes. He said, in prisons more frequently. He got thrown in jail. He, he got stopped by law enforcement and he got, I mean, there were all kinds of things coming against him. And then he said, in deaths often, and as you read down, you'll find out there was multiple occasions that either by a riot or be, because of some of this law enforcement or the religious leaders, he was beaten, I mean, literally to death or so they thought. They walked away thinking, well, he's done. Might as well stop beating him, he's dead. And they thought he was dead. A couple of times, he thought he was dead. He's like, I don't, I don't know if I died and went to heaven or I came back. I'm not really sure about that. But, but he thought he was dead. But this was very costly. But here's what I want you to, to notice. As you read through the list, these are categories, but as you read through the list, here's what you're gonna, we're gonna find out. He says, Satan hindered me, but every one of the things on the list were practical. They were natural. They were relationships. Sometimes with people, he thought, boy, this is it. We're in partnership together. And they were until they took that first step. And all of a sudden, things just got twisted up. And there's tension. And we can't seem to get along. We can't see what is going on. But there was lots of practical stuff, which tells us this. If some of you think, well, if we could just get this whole Christian thing right, you know, we can kind of get our devotions in and we're, we're praying the right way and we're going to church and we can find our rhythm, then we break out into the sunshine and life becomes this walk in this beautiful, tall, lush grass and, and it's just a park and the birds are singing and, you know, it's like it, that's never going to happen. Because the Bible says we're in a world, but we're not of this world. And, and over and over it tells us, especially in the New Testament, every time that we catch something from the Lord and we take a step in God's direction, the enemy is going to come and hinder us. He's going to come and try to stop us or slow us down or wear us out or help us make us go broke or something that's going to stop us in our track. And we're going to feel like, Paul, I tried more eagerly than ever. I worked harder than I ever have. And I I just couldn't seem to get over the hump. 
And this is what we see over and over again in the Bible. And lots of times he, he will launch out into the natural things. And that's part of the deception for you because it's natural stuff. Because all the appliances are breaking down and the car breaks down and you, know, you and your wife are just a little off kilter, you're not, not really seeing eye to eye and, and the dog gets sick and has to go to the vet. And because there's all these crazy things, you would never dawn on you, huh, maybe this is not just normal everyday life. Because some of it is. But it never dawned on you and Paul's helping us to understand. This is a reality. And so part of the reason I wanted you to come Today, this is family business, by the way, um, because that's exactly this, this scenario. No, not one for one exchanges, uh, but this is the exact scenario that our church has found ourselves in. And to make it more personal, Debbie and me have found ourselves in. And, and I'm only personalizing it there, not to solicit anything from you, but to open up your eyes and help you to think, because maybe some of you are in the same boat. Maybe some of you are going, what is going on? It feels like I can't win for losing. And yet that's exactly what the Bible says. We find ourselves in, in these situations. And so part of the reason that, part of what I, I begin to feel is the Lord saying, first of all, you as a pastor, you and Debbie as a couple, you need to lean in and be more intentional about prayer. You need to recognize this is not just a string of bad luck. This is not just, man, this is kind of weird. You know, it's been a challenging, this is very intentional and you need to recognize it in the church and you need to begin to call the church, say to another level, we need to step up and begin to pray more intentionally, more assertively, because let me just tell you this and I'll tell it from a personal testimony. Paul says it elsewhere, even though you're being challenged, not discouraged, we're in victory. Tired, but full of faith. Right? can see more than ever before. No, God's moving. No, I'm telling you, we're on the right track. We need to keep going, but we need to add something to our prayer life that will draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we're not gonna just keep going around the merry-go-round over and over. This is ridiculous. And, and, and it's legitimate in the Bible. Now, before we go on and look at it in scripture, which I, I wanna do today, at least to the best of my ability in one, one setting, uh, let me kind of bring some practicality to that. And, and this came through, not only prayer, but came through some, the counsel of some just stellar leaders in the church and elders and my wife and I talking about it. But uh, I had announced to you guys and put out a letter. I was supposed to go on a sabbatical starting tomorrow, but I'm gonna pivot. We, we feel like we wanna be honoring to what a sabbatical really is. And that's a time where we're spending more time with the Lord and we're refreshing. But at the same time, Debbie and I have had so many things going. I mean, crazy stuff happening in, in home repairs and, and some health issues. Thank the Lord, nothing major. All of them were just kind of minor, like what in the world is that? And, and so we need to, to line some things preventatively and, and financially, et cetera, et cetera. And so rather than not honoring what a sabbatical really is, we want to be honorable to recognize sometimes you just get in these situations you're like, I just got to put my life back together. And so I'm still gonna take the time off, but we're gonna be working to get life back together and, and, and do that. And so, um, so, so that, that's how it shifted, and I just want you to know that. We'll, we'll still talk about sabbatical. We think they're highly important. We'll still talk about that later on in the year. In the meantime, as we step out, you have pastors Brandon and Jenny here that will step in. The riskiest thing about that is every time that happens and they step in, the church grows. And then I start wondering, now why, what am I here for? And so I'm super excited about them. They've been gone for a couple weeks on vacation. Last week they were over at Catawba ministering, uh, but we're happy that they're here and we're happy they're gonna be stepping in. Now, let me say this one last thing because I know the culture we're in and I know that you know, there's all these murky things and there's documentaries on, t on you know, the apps and the cable channels and everything else. Let me just be really clear about this, all right? Debbie and I are stepping out uh, for a personal time, vacation time, to put life back together. We're not stepping into a sabbatical, but there's nothing shadowy going on here, right? Our marriage is great. There's no ethical, legal, moral failures. We've not been asked to step aside. Uh, we're not leaving the church. We're not headed off to rehab and, and any of the other suspicious boxes <laughs> that you might be tempted to check, all right? Listen, I'm, I'm being honest with you. It is what it is. We gotta put our house back together. We got to find a rhythm, get our life and our, our rest back. And, and that's all it is. If you have any questions, then you're welcome to come ask me. Go ask any of our staff members, any of our family members. 
uh, because we're just trying to be open and honest with you. That being said now, I should, if I didn't ask you, then now let's take what, what, what we're looking at already. Let's go to Genesis chapter 41. And, and it's gonna take me a minute to kind of get to the passage. Let me tell you how this message was first birthed in my heart. I was sitting at my desk at home uh, doing some studying. In fact, we were in the I Got Questions uh, series and, we're, and, we're, and I'm trying to wrestle through a couple of these things that as a teaching team we'd put on the table. And it happened to be just after the morning of the first homeowner's insurance claim we had to file. Yeah, first means there's more than one. That's why we're taking time off. And so uh, here I am studying, and, and I kind of looked up. There's a window in front of my little desk. I looked up, and just as I did, there's a lady that's walking, just a beautiful day, and she's walking. She's circling the cul-de-sac. She's got her AirPods or earbuds or something in, and she's in another world. You can tell she's just enjoying herself. And, and I kind of looked up to see that, and just as I saw that, something caught my attention out of my peripheral, and it was a little dog that the homeowners were dog sitting for, it got out of the screen, and this lady's walking in the beautiful sunshine, doesn't realize there's a tiny terror that's speeding at her as fast as he can, yipping, yipping, yip, 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 and she doesn't even know he's there until he gets to her feet and starts nipping at her heels. Startled, she screams, and then she kind of steps back and recoils, like, what's going on? And then when she saw what it was, you could, you could literally see her go, oh, like it's just this little, look at it, it's like a hamster, you know, a hamster on a leash, right? <laughs> tiny, tiny little thing. And so she, you know, she tried to just ignore it. She's just going to keep walking. But that just, you know, made the dog all the more resolved that he's going to, you know, he's going to take control of this or whatever he's doing until finally she went, I don't know, five or six steps and she just couldn't do it anymore. And she turned around, stamped her foot and she said, go home. And when that happened, the dog froze. And for a moment there, you could almost hear the Clint Eastwood, you know, to see who, who's going to break the staring contest, right? Who's, who's going to back off? And then just as it looked like the dog was going to launch again, she took another aggressive step or two towards the dog, and she said, I said, go home. And when she did that, the dog turned around and hightailed it back to the house that he was staying at just in time for the owner to open the screen and realize he was out, scoop him up and give an awkward stare to the lady like, so sorry, you know, and then take him on into the house. It, the whole thing lasted probably, I don't know, a minute and a half. But it was enough for me to remember a lesson that I'd learned years earlier. And it has to do with spiritual authority. Every one of us Christians have it. But so many Christians are either oblivious to it or, or they're just not confident enough and they fail to utilize it. And so because of that, the enemy does everything from what that little dog was doing, just ruining and annoying what should be a wonderful journey and experience all the way to doing what he was trying to do to Paul and hinder and stop him at every single turn, but, but we don't really realize it. So what I want to really talk to you about today is I want to talk to you about the importance of prayer, but more importantly, getting to that assertive kind of prayer. And I know in order to do that, we don't have time to, to be super systematic and lay it all out. And some of you, you know, you're like, no, we totally know what you're talking about. Others are like, yeah, I know, but I haven't been doing that. And there's some of you that will be like, first time hearing it, I have no concept. So I'm going to try to lay a broad foundation and help us to understand why prayer is so essential and important. And then we're going to progress through how, how prayer unfolds so we can look specifically at what this part is, the asserted part of prayer. And then as, as we get there, I'm hoping I'll have some time to skip a rock through the New Testament. And you can see the New Testament is, is I mean, laced. You can't open a book of the Bible in the New Testament that it's not encouraging us to process through the prayer approach to get to this assertiveness so that we can stand up, stand our ground, and we can lay claims to what Jesus has purchased for us. And we can begin to move forward in the plan of God unhindered, even though the enemy is going to keep challenging us. All right, so let me first uh, give a, a big, broad overview. Again, we don't have time to teach super broad overview about how prayer works. You, you have to think about prayer uh, about in, in terms of communication. And prayer 
is like anything else in effective communication, you have to understand the right prayer component or the right prayer approach that will line up with the intended purpose or the intended result you want in order to have a meaningful exchange. Let me give you a playful example. If you wanted to communicate love and affection to your sweetheart, the best approach is probably not to pull out all the graphs and the charts that show the enormous amount of effort that you put in and how many wins you've accumulated over the past six months to a year and, and pull out you know, some legal jargon, some principal jargon that, that tells them, you know, when principal comes, it shows that if 60% of the time, that, that's probably not the way you're gonna do it. You're not gonna achieve your success. Any more than if you're in a legal negotiation, you're trying to put together a contract, or more, more, more important, if you're in a court proceeding, if you start quoting poetry, and you start whispering, and you start you know, reaching over and just rubbing the hand of the person trying to the contract, that's not going to work for you either. That's probably going to get you thrown out or charges filed against you, right? But Christians don't seem to understand the, the, the simplicity, but also the, the, the systematic approach, like the social etiquettes of a spiritual engaging conversation with God. So here's what I want to do really quickly. I just want to outline them for you and show you how they, they, uh, they escalate into each other so that you can actually begin to have an exchange with God and so you can get all the way through the exchange to find this confidence. The New Testament gives at least six different types of prayer. Uh, really, there's seven if you count praying in the Spirit. That's those that have a prayer language. And the praying in the Spirit really is the best way to jumpstart a conversation because Romans chapter 8 says, sometimes I don't even know where to start. Well, that's a perfect place to start and the Holy Spirit starts helping you unpack and, and kind of get, you know, get your mind right. Uh, but then praying in the Spirit laces all the way through every one of those conversations in prayer and in, including the last one. So praying in the Spirit's number seven. I won't list that, uh, but let me give you the other six. The first two are more about you setting your internal balance, calibrating you. And so the first two, the first one's the prayer of thanksgiving. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And the first thing we do is thanksgiving. But it's not for the reason you might think. It's not because, well, we just have to be appreciative for the Lord. It, it's, it, it, it does do that, but it's really to calibrate your own heart and mind. In the middle of chaos, in the middle of circumstances, in the middle of really long work weeks, and I'm just trying to get through another day, stopping and calibrating your heart with thanksgiving reminds you that you've been in tough situations before, but the goodness and the grace of God has already pulled you out over and over and over again. It also points forward to the things that God's promised he's going to do, even though you haven't experienced those yet. All of those provokes thanksgiving, which reminds us this relationship with a faithful, good, gracious, merciful, loving God is real. And that, that helps you realize I'm not going to some ruler in the sky who really doesn't care. I'm just a number. I happen to, you know, get my requests up there. You're, you're going to your heavenly father who deeply loves and cares about you. And that, that just warms your heart. From there, the next part of prayer is consecration. And that's just you once you begin to realize how faithful God is what he's already done, what he promised he would do, how much he loves you, then it, it spurs your heart on to sincerely commit yourself. I'm, I'm not gonna walk away from you. You're my savior, you're my Lord. You're number one on, on my heart. To commit to following his written word, to following the Holy Spirit. If there's anything off that he's trying to talk to you about, commit yourself to say, Lord, I wanna be right and I wanna understand that. The first two components are really important because they calibrate relationship. Now, when... Once you get that relationship calibrated, then, step, then uh, numbers three and four go external. And numbers, number three is the prayer of supplication. And, and that's just this very broad, passionate plea in areas that you have need, in areas that, that you really want to see God and come help with. But it's very broad. So I need strength. 
Well, that's really broad, right? I need wisdom. Well, that's really broad. I I need help in our relationship. I need help in our finances. Well, that's really big broad. But you're leaning into the fact that God loves me, that he's faithful, that all these promises, he said they belong to me. And you're leaning into that confident relationship. And now you're opening up your heart and saying, okay, so here's where I'm at today. And, and that's just opening up and you're, you're, you're being you know, vulnerable to him and you're pleading. But as you do that, then the Holy Spirit begins to help frame in your thoughts and your mind and draw from some of the promises and, and the things you've studied. And then the prayer of supplication turns into the prayer of petition. And the prayer of petition now is a very specific request based in a very particular area, usually attached to the assurance of a specific promise. So in other words, you went from, Lord, I just, need, I just need more resources. And as you're praying and pouring your heart to the Lord, the Holy Spirit reminded you and you said, Lord, in fact, I don't just need broad resources. I'm really concerned about this area right here. I have this one thing. I didn't see it coming and I need help in that area. And by the way, you promised me and, and you start attaching these. It gets very specific and very personal, right? So follow me so far because this is what happens in all of our everyday conversations, we talk to somebody, hey, I appreciate you meeting with me. You know how much I love you and how many times I've called. Every time I call, you always seem to, you know, something good. And yeah, and I just want you to know, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very, very appreciative for that. By the way, the reason I called you here because, and you start unpacking stuff. This is how prayer works. And it's important that we allow that to be experienced because as we do and we get our petition out there to the Lord, Then it moves to the last two areas and these areas are more outward and they get much more assertive. And here's why the the next area is the prayer of intercession. You start thinking about all this stuff and you start realizing, Lord, I'm not the only one who needs this. And you might think about your spouse, you might think about your children, you might think about somebody else that you know, and intercession is when you take all those things, the prayer, the relationship, and the, the, the faith that gratitude brings, and, and then the, you know, from the general all the way to the specific thing, and you bring somebody else's name into that. In other words, you're going to the throne of God, not for what you need in the moment, but you're bringing what somebody else needs. And as you're doing that, then the Bible says somewhere uh, in, in all of that conversation comes the prayer of authority or some people, the Bible, scriptures call it also the prayer of faith. And this is the final culmination. It's when something clicks on the inside of you. And all of a sudden you realize this is not just me thanking the Lord for what he said he was going to do. This is not just me asking the Lord for what I need him to do. This is that confident assurance, like the conversation has got to the point where I know on the inside, faith is rising. Oh, he's going to do it. He's absolutely going to do it. You can hear the tone change. You can sense the strength and you begin to kind of, you know, stand a little taller and, and be a little more confident. And when you do that, you also begin to declaratively extend God's promise and God's rule out into your circumstances where you started by just saying, Lord, I just want to thank you because I've every time in the past I've had a problem, you've always helped me. And I want you to know I'm going to stay with you. I'm coming to you because I trust you. I'm going to do what the Bible says. And I just need you know strength and wisdom in this area. In fact, this one area right now, and you get real specific. And as you're doing all those things, then suddenly you begin to recognize, hey, this is real. And faith begins to rise, and you find yourself going from a question mark to a declaration. Let let me give you a practical example that really helped me in my prayer life. I grew up with two other brothers. And as you know how brothers are, you know, we're always sweet and loving and supportive of each other. Not, right? Constant competition, constant conflict there. And we had a rule in the house that we weren't allowed to go and just whine and tattletale. But if we had a case, if we had something needed to be decided, rather than fight it out, we could make a decision to to come to debt. Now, the risk was, if you came to dad and he thought it was a whiny tattletale, you got in trouble because you didn't face it and try to handle it. But if you came to him and you could make a case, then dad would hear you out and dad would say, okay, you go tell your brothers. And, and if that happened to be in your favor, I'm telling you, walk back in the room just a little taller than you did before. You walk back in the room and you said, hey, and they would look up at you. Dad said... And honestly, it didn't matter what came after that. Totally irrelevant. Once dad spoke, 
then we all knew if we didn't all three comply to what dad said, there were uh, consequences for that. And dad was fairly generous with those. So we begin to understand, listen to me, while the Bible talks about all of these types of prayer have to be engaged, we have to grow in our conversation, in our relationship, our closeness, in understanding the Lord and understanding his word and and being able to follow the Holy Spirit as he directs us through these conversations. This morning, I really want to focus on that last part, that authority, that assertiveness. What happens when we get to that point and we can go back into the circumstances of our life and like either the lady with the little dog say, go home, or we can do what we used to do growing up and, and go back and say, dad said, and it settles it. Now, all of that, I want to bring you to the story of Joseph, because I I was studying this. I got question series. I happened to be in Genesis 41, the story of Joseph. And this is when this whole thing unfolded. And I felt right then, uh, we've got to bring a different message to hone in on this. So let me me just quickly outline the, the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph can be understood in three sets of dreams. The first set of dream Joseph had, and God spoke some things to him and said, here's what I want to do for your life. And Joseph was all excited, just assumed that his brothers and his mom and dad were going to be excited with him. So he shared the dream and he found out people aren't always excited to hear what you said, what you believe the Lord's going to do for you. In fact, the first set of dreams got him thrown into a pit, got him sold into slavery, eventually got him sentenced to prison for a crime he didn't commit which is where he encountered the second set of dreams. Neither of them were his. Two guys that were in prison had these dreams and they just kept haunting them and they shared them with Joseph and Joseph's like, actually, I, I think I know what they mean. And he, and he told them the interpretation and it happened exactly the way that Joseph said. And when one of them got back who was working in Pharaoh's court, when one of them got back, later on Pharaoh had some dreams and he said, I know who can interpret those for you. So the second set of dreams Joseph interpreted and it got him moved from the prison up to the palace, at least temporarily. That's where he encountered the third set of dreams. And the third set of dreams were by Pharaoh himself. And Joseph not only interpreted the dreams, but Joseph also included some recommendations about how Pharaoh should respond to the dream. And that got him promoted from the prison all the way to a place of prominence and power. It's important we we recognize Joseph's life. I don't have the time I wish I did. But Joseph's life, all scholars agree, is what they call a shadow or a parallel to the big, bolder things that would unfold in the life of Jesus. And so when we read in the Old Testament what was going on with Joseph, man, we can just see fingerprints everywhere about what actually would happen with Jesus and how they would apply. So I want you to hold that in mind. Let me read in Genesis 41. We're going to start in verse 37. And let me show you where this assertiveness in prayer comes in. It said, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such, such a one as this, a man in whom, the spirit, whom is the spirit of God? Let me just stop and, and say, Pharaoh didn't get, didn't get converted. He wasn't a believer, but Pharaoh was a very spiritual man lost in the occults. And he recognized there was something going on in Joseph's life that was not just natural. There was something divine, something supernatural, and Joseph was drawing from this wisdom. Verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain on his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. And so he set him, or that's the way he set him over all the land of Egypt. Now, again, there's so many parallels here. But if you just look at this last scene, you see Pharaoh, who's the ruler over all of Egypt, and he's bringing Joseph from the prison and setting him up right at his right hand, second in command. And you're almost reading a layover of Hebrews chapter one, 
where the Bible says that God pulls Jesus out of death's prison and exalts him to, to the right hand of God and now installs him as the Lord over everything. Well, then you have Joseph himself who steps into a place of prominence and power and authority and now he's over all and he's the one responsible to make all the decisions. Again, that's exactly what Hebrews chapter one says that Jesus is. He holds the scepter of righteousness. He's the Lord over the church according to Ephesians chapter four. He's the one that is ruling and Lord over all. But then you keep reading in the story and it says, and they cried out before him, bowed the knee. Who's they? And as you're reading the parallels, you find out that both Joseph and Jesus always had these forerunners, always had these people that were responsible to take the, the power and the prominence that was given to Joseph and was given to Jesus and then go out and be the ones that announced that that cleared the way so that the presence of the Lord could come, so that Joseph could ride in the, in the parade and everybody could see that Joseph is who he says he is because he could make those decisions. That was their responsibility. And we find in the New Testament, it, it's the exact same. In fact, when we look at the word they there, it's really not as generic as we think. It, it's a delegated term that was talking about a specific official that was authorized to walk before a a ruler or walk before a, a, a tablet that was announcing a decree and to declare this is an official law to get people's attention. And that term bow the knee was actually an Egyptian term and, and it was, it was uh, describing a loud and prominent announcement that a royal presence was coming through and it had an, an air of command that you will submit to the sovereign rule of the person that's coming behind me, thus bow the knee. You're not in charge here, they're in charge here. Now, when I read that, I grew up in Southern California, and every year, uh, as you're crossing New Year's Eve into New Year, there's this really huge event that takes place in Pasadena. It's the Pasadena Rose Parade. Got to be honest with you, didn't really care too much about the parade. But I absolutely loved the celebration that would happen 24 hours before when hundreds of thousands of people would begin to line the streets of Pasadena for miles and miles. And all that night, they had fire pits and music and they're all in their own little groups and parties. And, and you could just walk up and down. It was like, you know, miles and miles of a New Year's party. You see everything you want. But they also had uh, more police officers than ever. And they had already put out barricades. They'd already make sure that, you know, the, the lines painted were, were clear and fresh and accurate. And when the sun began to come up on New Year's Day, the police officers would go into full mobility and they would start walking the parade route saying, hey, move all your stuff back. Hey, put that fireplace away. Hey, you can't have that here. The parade's getting ready to come. Everybody has to be behind the line. You have to be in certain, you know, certain seating positions and because the parade's gonna come, nothing can hinder the parade. And I think about what happened with Joseph, how messy this was, how intentional this was, how arduous this was for those that were, that were called to cry out and to go to prepare the way. And I also think about what would have happened if they wouldn't have done that. What would have happened if Joseph just started you know, riding the chariot and trying to get through the crowd and what would have happened? But there was an intentional plan to say, no, you need a forerunner to clear the way, to clear all the clutter out so that the ruler can come and do what he promised he would do. Now let me fast forward and bring you into the New Testament. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is praying. And in verse one, it says, it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I'll add this, teach us to pray like that. When you read the other gospels, you realize Jesus wasn't just doing what the religious leaders did. In fact, in Matthew chapter six, he said, don't do what the religious leaders do. Don't stand there and just repeat your eloquent prayers over and over again so that people can think you're very religious and you're very spiritual as if you're impressing God. Nope. Jesus engaged in full, passionate, authentic conversation. And his disciples watched him and were listening. And they got after one of these prayers, they said, teach us to do that. I mean, John taught his disciples. And so Jesus said to them, all right, when you pray, not if, 
When you pray, he says, say this. And you know what comes next. It's called the Lord's Prayer. We don't have time to go through all of it. Let me just give you the first couple lines because that's what I want want to show you this morning. He said, when you pray, say this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thanksgiving, consecration, you're God, I'm not. You're my heavenly Father. So there's the relational part of the prayer. But then he comes and he says, your kingdom come and your will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven. And most Christians don't catch or understand partially because it's been widely practiced and and not, not demonstrated this way, but partially because we just don't lean into the text enough. But we don't understand that there's an authoritative verb tense there. This is an authoritative posture. This is not just a rote prayer we're reading because we think if we say it enough times that God will say, wow, you really are spiritual. Okay, I'll I'll do something for you. But this actually comes with the confidence, with a posture that says, no, we serve a God who is to be hollowed. We serve a God that's great. He's sovereign above everybody and he's my heavenly father. I'm part of his family and it builds a confidence there. In fact, in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, Dr. Jack Hayford writes uh, in the Kingdom Dynamics in Luke chapter 11, he writes this. It's a phenomenal. He says, earthly scenes of need must be penetrated by God's will here on earth just as it is in heaven lest either the, the weakness of, human, of the human being rule that's being given or controlled or governed by their flesh or the viciousness of hell's work initiated by the devil will prevail. God's power can and will bring heaven's rule to bear. However, the praying is ours to do. Unless we contend for the intervention of his kingdom, nothing will change. He's not alone in that opinion. Pick up any of the serious resources on prayer and and you'll either read the line or you'll see it obviously implied. Nothing happens on earth without prayer. Nothing happens in the life of a believer without prayer. Everything's contingent on our having these conversations. And some of you might be saying, ah, Pastor Girl, I don't know if I can believe with that. And to which I would like to respond and say, well, let me add a little more scriptural secret sauce on this, all right? And you'll see, this is a common theme all the way through the Bible. We just don't catch into it. Go back to Jesus' original mission. And because we don't have time to unpack it, I'm gonna read it in the amplified classic version. Here's is what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, that is the powers of the infernal region shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. And I will give you, talking to the members of the church, at the time he was talking to the disciples, but later on he said, anybody that believes what you're saying, they become disciples too. So he's talking to you and I, he says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so that whatever is forbidden in heaven, you can, as an authorized representative of me, forbid it on earth uh, with the full confidence that heaven will back you. And whatever is approved in heaven, you can, as an authorized representative of me, approve to come to pass on earth as well with the full confidence that heaven will back you. In fact, we did a study called Living an Empowered Life Uh, last year at the end of 2022. And you all got, if that were here, you got discipleship workbooks. And if you write this down, you can go back, lesson number 10, page 24. We were studying this very thing. And here's what, what it says. Most Christians today see themselves as mere subjects of heaven instead of authorized representatives of Jesus. Accordingly, their prayers lack the bold confidence of one who's been given a kingdom key ring loaded with the promises of God that grant them spiritual access into and out of circumstances and situations where evil influences need to be evicted and God's promised blessings invoked. This is our responsibility. By the way, I've not met very many people who don't understand this in other parts of their life, right? We just filed two homeowners insurance claims almost back to back. And you better believe I had the policy out in front of me And I'm looking to see what's covered and what's not covered. And I'm on the phone, super gracious, but I'm on the phone say, ah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but didn't, isn't that covered under, oh yeah, I see Mr. Durham and I'm glad you caught that. I'm glad I caught it too. (laughs) Because if I didn't catch that, you wouldn't have caught it. And yet it belongs to me. 
And we understand this in so many other areas of life that we have to, we have to press in and learn and then register it and then with confidence come back and we have to draw a line and say, Dad said. And all of this is dependent all over the Bible. Let, let me give you another one. Oh, that was Jesus' original mission. Uh, let me give you another one. In the great commission, this is when we're literally invited in. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Bow the knee, prepare the way. You're giving the word of the Lord. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Listen to verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. And we studied that word signs literally means this is the authentication that will follow your life when you draw these lines and with authority you declare that God's word is true. God said, heaven will back you. But if you don't say anything, then, then you'll survive and, and you'll keep your Christianity, but you're going you're gonna to be like Paul. Like, I don't know, Satan's hindering me. We need to draw a line in the sand here. And so it, it says here, it says, uh, these signs will follow you to believe. And listen to the very first sign. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, in other words, we studied it. In other words, with the authority that I've given them with the badge, the spiritual empowerment they have, they will cast out, it's the word Greek word, ekbalo, it literally means to evict. It means to walk into a circumstance and say, you don't get to stay here anymore because God promised me something different. You don't get to hinder this anymore. You don't get to do this to me, to my, my family, to my relationship, to, to, to my finances. You don't get to do this anymore. In fact, let me read you a quote out of Lesson 10 again, out of that Living the Empowered Life. It says, although some confrontations can be demonstrably difficult, most demonic evictions and the inherent blessings happen as Matthew 18, 16 describes with a word. Now, I know you've, you know you've seen The Exorcist and all that. Maybe, I hope you haven't. I haven't, but I hope you haven't. But if you did, and you think this has to get really super weird, and, you know, there's sometimes when they've got a real demonic thing going on, and, and you, you might need some help to navigate that, and, and, and that, that's a real thing, right? But most of the time, it's not that. Most of the time, it's just you recognizing and turning around with your authority, putting your foot down and say, get and you watch the enemy do, do exactly what the Bible promises he would do. It, it doesn't really take that. Goes on and says, declaring something like, in the name of Jesus, I command you to stop this harassment forever. And instead, I invite the lordship of Jesus to come and rule. That's usually sufficient to drive an evil influence out of a person's life and their circumstance. Now, by the way, let me just give you a couple more and we'll close because this is all over the New Testament. You cannot turn to one book in the New Testament, starting with the book of Acts, that doesn't confirm this and elaborate with instruction about the importance of us standing up as ambassadors of Christ, as bona fide citizens of heaven, as children of a living God representing him in the earth. You can't find one book of the Bible that won't confirm that and give you even more instruction. And let me just give you a couple of nuances. You can write these down. These are just a couple, by the way. In Romans 8, 37, it says in all these things, and it lists all these different natural and some spiritual circumstances. I mean, about like what we're living in now. It says in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now, not in and of ourself, but, but more than conquerors, the term there means someone who's endowed with an overwhelming ability to be victorious. That's what we have. It's an authority. It's an access to, to the power and the presence, the intervention of God. It's not you and I. It's like the police officer who stands in front of moving traffic and he puts up his hand like this and, and, and you look at the badge and you look at his uniform. Now listen, the person himself can't stop any cars. The car could just keep right on going. But they see the badge and they recognize he's authorized and if something happens to him, the entire law enforcement uh, is going to come out in force and find that person and punish them. And so when he stands up there, I don't care if he's five foot three, a hundred pounds soaking wet, when he puts his hand up like this, all the traffic comes to a screeching halt. 
you and I don't understand, we carry the authority of heaven. And when we begin to understand that, there's going to be times in the life of your children, in your marriage, where you may not say it to a person, but you're going to turn around and you're going to say, all right, enough. That's it. We're not doing this anymore. And you're going to do it based on the authority of God. And as you do, the Bible says that, that, that heaven will come to bear. In fact, Romans 8 goes on and says that all these things that it lists, it says nothing's going to separate you from the love of Christ. By the way, that's not the warm, passionate emotion of God. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about this deep relationship you have now being born into God's family and all of the commitment that he has and all that he's given to authorize you as a kingdom representative, as a child of the king to say, hey, do you know who my dad is? You don't get to do that to me. You, don't get, you, you just don't get to do that and to draw a line. And as you do, the Bible says that all of heaven will respond. That's what Ephesians chapter six is all about. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the strategies, the wiles, all the little tricks and, and, and the traps of the enemy. And you, you, why would he say that if we didn't have any of that to do? If we just waited and God somehow just does a wonderful thing and meanwhile, well, we're just trying to hang on. No, there comes a time when we draw a line and we say, you're not doing that to me anymore, ever again. Let me end, I'll read you this passage and we're gonna end here. First Peter chapter five, verse eight, listen to this. It says, be sober, clear thinking, be vigilant. That's a military term, by the way. It means pay attention because we're not in peacetime everywhere all the time. There's times when the enemy's coming after us. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Man, I wish we could top, stop and unpack that. But let me just tell you this. He can't devour anybody and everybody that he wants to. You know, he's seeking whom he may devour, and we've unpacked it here before. He devours people who don't understand the authority they have in Christ and who just let him whittle them away down to a puddle, down to nothing. In fact, the word devour there doesn't mean he, you know, he jumps on you like a lion with his claws and rips you to shred. The word devour there literally means he comes along and slurps up whatever's left because people allow themselves to disintegrate well, I know what the Bible says, but I just don't see why God, because you're not staying in the conversation long enough to, to, to get the confidence to say, okay, that's it, enough's enough. And he will whittle you down. He will wear you out. And you'll get to the place where you're so exhausted and so despondent that all the enemy just has to come do is just lap up what little faith you have left. And that's it. And so the Bible says here, pay attention to that. And then let's listen to what it says instead in verse nine. It says, resist him steadfast in the faith. The word resist means literally put up a barrier, put up a wall and say, you will not cross this line. Not on my watch. It says to, to put up an offense, uh, uh, an offense and push back against him. And it says, do it steadfast. It means firm, immovable, unwilling to yield until victory's won. You put it up in faith. And then it goes on, listen to this. It says, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brothers around the world. One of the biggest weapons the enemy have is to convince you, well, it's only you. Everybody else is having a great life. Look at all the Facebook. Look at all the pictures. They're having fun doing stuff. I'm the only one. You're not the only one. The enemy does this to everybody. This is how it works around the world. When you decide to serve God, the enemy's going to lean in, but I want you to understand, you're the victorious ones. You're more than conquerors. We don't fight for victory. We fight from a place of victory. We, we're not worried about us fighting the battles. The battle's already been won. We just put up our hand and say, knock it off. Dad said, stop this right now. Bow the knee. And we watch the enemy do exactly what God promised he would. It goes on and says, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. When I first read that, that part didn't settle with me after you've suffered for a while. 
So God's just kind of watching back, you know, sitting back with a Coke and some popcorn and just saying, watch this, watch this. Let's see how long this guy can hold out. That's not at all what it means. In fact, the Christian Jewish Bible says, you will have to suffer only a little while. But after that, God who is full of grace, the one who, you called, to, who called you to his eternal glory in union with the Messiah will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you and make you firm. And the word suffer there is the word basco. It literally means you're gonna experience an outward pressure that's trying to stop you, to hinder you, to, to discourage you, to wear you out. But that'll only last a little while because as soon as you draw a line and say, not ever again, then immediately heaven goes to work. It'll, t- it'll turn around. Immediately, it, things will be turning around. Let me bring it to a close. As, as we grow across three campuses in our church and as we endeavor to grow individually, we have to understand this is how, this is, this is how the world's working right now. The world's becoming more antagonistic and more aggressive against the things of God. I personally believe that a turnaround is coming. I'm not saying that we're going to, you know, find the political prowess we once did or we're going to, you know, go back to the nation. This is not a patriotic declaration. But I believe that God's waking his children up. I believe that across the United States, across the world, that Christians everywhere are starting to get that rumble in, in their spirit and faith is beginning to rise and they're getting ready to stand up and say, that's it. We're not doing this. Dad said... And I'm telling you, as we begin to understand that as a church, as we stop just coming and being beat up and Lord, just help me to get through another week. But as we begin to realize you're the victors, you're the strong ones. We can stay impoverished if we want. We can just be dragging along or we can recognize we've been given lavish blessings. We've been given everything we need. All we have to do is stand up and step into them and draw a line and say, bow the knee. Turn and look at your circumstance. Look at that thing that's pressing you. Say, you will bow your knee to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. And when you begin to do that over and over and over, the Bible promises heaven goes into action and will come to bear and say, I got you. I'm backing you. And the Bible says the devil will flee from you. He will run from you. I'm calling you as a church to step up individually, but also as a church body. Listen to me, we need to be a church where the power and the faith and the anointing of God pulsates in our services, not in some demonstration. I'm not even even thinking about that. In our hearts. We need to be a church that when it's time for the altar team to come up, we're standing two or three people deep. Why? Because everybody's so beat up? No, because every single one of you came in the building today and you've got something you're trying to move forward or push through and or you've got somebody that you're wanting to see good things happen in their life. Why would you not come and take advantage of the power source that God's given us and say, listen to me, I'm coming here today to stand in agreement and prayer so that we can stand together and say, bow the knee. You're not going to lord me, O Lord, over me anymore. But I'm going to step up into the promise and the prominence that Jesus has given me. And I'm going to watch me and my family and my friends and those that are around me. I'm going to watch us experience the victory of God because this is what the Bible promises us. There's so much more, so many more scriptures that validate this. But I'm calling you today, engage this thing. Please don't let another Sunday service go by that you're not up here being prayed for because God's given you an opportunity to do that. Please please stay afterwards and let me help you to see how you give me 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. You give me 15 minutes, one of those. And not only will, will you help us to strengthen and rise as a church and we'll touch people's lives all over these communities around our campuses, but I'll show you how to pray individually, how to not just happen at church, how to take it home and how to walk into situations and say, you know what, it just dawned on me, this is not just stuff. This is the enemy and we're not gonna put up with this anymore. And you begin turning situations around. God's put it at our feet. It's for us to take advantage of. And I'm asking you to step in with me and let's watch God do what he wants to do. Stand to your feet with me. Let me pray for you and we'll dismiss today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. This is alive. It's not just meant to comfort us or inspire us. Lord, it's meant to empower us. It's meant to authorize us, to take us, Lord, from being sheep all the way to being the the part of the lions of the tribe of Judah. 
that we stand up and when the enemy roars, we roar back louder and stronger and we watch him just run away for fear of punishment from the Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're the teacher that every discouragement, every despair, every fear, every, uh, uh, every, um, just every fatigue, every part of fatigue that's hanging on people this morning, that that would drop away and the word of the Lord would penetrate their heart this morning and help them to know God's got a wonderful, victorious plan for them. No matter what circumstance they're in, God's got a way out. And God will do what he promised he would do as we rise to the occasion. Give us courage, give us confidence, and give us faith this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Come on, say it like you mean it. Amen, amen.